technically we are in class. It's not, we've been being taught about finances. So I felt like if I was going to be behind the pulpit, I felt like I was going to be preachy when we need to be teachy. So to be in teaching mode, I didn't want to be behind the pulpit. So just a little different. And I'm just going to share this little nugget with you all. I am extremely nervous. I don't know why, but I am. So please bear with me and pray for me. I actually need that other stand back there, please, if you don't mind. So we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to get into some things as far as budgeting. Um, I wasn't able to come last week. I got stuck in traffic, but I know Pastor Brigham was not going to let me off the hook. I knew he was not going to let me off the hook, no matter how hard I thought I was going to be able to get off or try to get off. Um, I think this is fine. Perfect. Thank you. I knew I wasn't going to be able to do so. Nevertheless, the work of the Lord must go on. I do give honor to God, to our overseers, Apostle and First Lady Rogers, to our very own pastor and our very own elect Lady Brigham in her absence, to all the saints, visitors, and friends tonight. I thank God for coming to my life, saving me, sanctifying me, and filling me up with his precious Holy Ghost. I appreciate God for just being a good God. I don't take that lightly because there's not too many people, especially my age, around my age group, they have a desire to be saved. They even want to live for Christ, but I thank God for being a keeper. I also thank God for the people of God that checked on me. Right on the street that I live on, there was a, a really big fire. It was huge. It was two apartment units that caught on fire, and it was blocked off as I was getting ready to come to work. We couldn't even go down Ferguson to get on the highway because this apartment complex literally you can see it burning and it started from the roof and the, both of these units look like the fire was just coming down the fire department was out there and i magnify god because um sister moore texted me and she was like are you okay and i was like okay what's going on slept through the whole thing didn't even know what was going on right around me and it's literally only a a little partition that's divided the apartments and I thank God because we're talking about protection because I remember when I was 15 years of age, my mother was in an apartment complex. My brother and I had, my mother was the kind of person, she didn't go to church, but she sent me and my brother. And we were in church, came home to a crisp, to nothing. Little five-year-old boys that stayed underneath us, they were real bad, y'all, bad. Tony, I can't think of the other one, but Tony was, ooh, he was bad. I used to call him Big Head Tony. He was five, had a big old head, and he was just bad. Anyway... You know, these parents now, they don't raise their kids. And the grandmother was old, and she was trying to raise these bad kids, trying to smoke a cigarette in the closet. And they started in the room, and the room was upstairs from, you know how apartments are from our room. Burnt it. We didn't have a thing. So as I'm driving down the road, I'm praying, and I'm like, Lord, please don't let there be any fatalities. But yet my mind went back. I remember coming home to not having a thing. And the Red Cross and different ones had to give us things because we didn't have anything. So on tonight, I'm very thankful. I'm grateful to God because he protects us and we don't even realize how he's, how he's protecting us. I'm waking up half sleep, looking crazy, like what fire? And then to see it and then to bring back memories of man, one day that was me. And I thank God and I appreciate him. And my heart goes out to the family because I know what that's like, and especially being young and still in school and need clothes and shoes and supplies and things like that. But God is a good God. He's, he's phenomenal. I thank him and I appreciate him. And like I said, I'm nervous about this because I was, I'm gonna tell you, I got to tell him myself. I'm so, I tell him myself because I did. I was like, why Pastor Brigham chose me to do financial literacy? I'm like, he started. I'm like, Pastor Brigham can go on and finish it. He already started. I think he's doing a phenomenal job. How can I talk about finances when I'm still trying to get mine together? That's how, honestly, that's what I was thinking to myself. I'm like, okay, Lord. And the reason I'm, I'm got to set the stage for this. So my thing was this, we're talking about financial literacy. And the minute you want to take back your finances is the day I set my own self back. Today is only Wednesday. I'm telling on myself because we're going to help each other out today. Today is only Wednesday. And I believe from Monday to Wednesday, I've already spent $30 on out to eat. Okay. Let's just talk about that. Okay. All right. So let's just put that out there. I just want to throw that out there before we get into our lesson. And I'm doing that because 
as we are talking and as we are, as I'm teaching this, I don't want it to come across like a, because it's not, but one word you're going to hear me say a lot is decisions. As saints of God, we do not make sound decisions. And I will also throw this out there. As far as a smaller scale, when it comes to the smaller churches, we do talk about the mega churches. And yeah, there is a lot of one save, I always say, being taught. They do teach a lot of things against biblical knowledge. But on the natural side of things, they have us beat. And when it comes down to practical living, financial literacy, they actually have these classes. And the sad thing about it, there are a lot of us who have the knowledge, who have the potential to do it, but we don't have the boldness. And because you don't have the boldness to do it, then we have to put ourselves out there. So tonight, I'm going to talk about me a lot because in this journey to financial literacy, there are habits that we must stop in order to recognize the habits that we need that are good for us and being producers of the fruit that God has given us. Because he's chosen us to be stewards, but what we do while we're doing the stewardship of the things he's given us determines how far we go. So we're going to go into a familiar passage of scripture on tonight. Very familiar. All right, Ian, we're going to get you on out of here so you can get a bottle. We we ain't going to be here all night, brother. I understand you're hungry. So we're going to go to the book of Matthew, the 25th chapter. And we're going to read verses 14 through 21. And everybody knows this scripture. This is a very good scripture. And before we get into it, you know, we, we're quick to be like, yeah, I'm going to you know, God gave this person talents, gave this guy, gave that. But as we're reading this scripture on tonight, I want us to put ourselves in the shoes because I'm going to talk about something tonight. And it brought, it slapped me in my face and how I spend money this week. Well, excuse me, these days. Um... Show me what steward I, where I was on the stewardship list. And let's just say I blew it, okay? So, Matthew 25, verse 14. This is the parable of the talents. So, we know this is a parable. We know a parable is a, a heavenly story, but it has a... I'm sorry, an earthly story, but it has a heavenly meaning. And we know a lot of times we're talking about Christ and his return. And we're going to get on that side, too, because the spiritual aspect is very important with finances. That's very important. So we're going to discuss that. But let's talk about this parable. And as we're discussing this parable, let's look at where we fall at this present time, this parable. Verse 14 reads, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Now, we thought we were doing something when we had Wall Street and brokers. Stock market and stock exchange was going on way back in the day. So this is investing. That's not part of my teaching because I feel like Pastor Brigham or someone might, there be somebody else teaching. I don't want to teach on all that. But a little investing was going on here in the scripture. So 15 says, and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But, uh-oh, he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I'm going to stop right there because we're going to skip around a little bit. So this is a story which we know this story is actually in referring to, referring to Jesus. We know he left. We know he's coming back. But in the midst of him leaving and coming back, he's entrusted some things to some individuals. 
Now, the word of God says that he's given the, he gave these talents according to each of one of their several ability. Lord, the Lord knows what we can handle and what we can't handle. So at the end of the day, even upon his return, we are going to be without excuse. So he's given out these talents and in expectancy, he's looking for more. We call it in the financial world, ROI, a return on investment. When you invest, you were looking for a return on your investment. So the Lord has invested into these people, but yet only two had a good rapport. And then there was one who didn't have a good rapport. And it's a note that came to me as I was studying this. And, I, and it says, if there is no relationship, there is no trust. Believe it or not, even in our finances, to trust God means to trust him with everything that we have, including our finances. We quote, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Well, that's the same thing with our finances. The problem is, just like this servant, we're going to talk about him in a minute. The two servants, they had a relationship with him. They trusted him. They knew that the amount of money that was given to them, they knew that that the master was going to come back and he was going to ask them, what did they make? in return of what he gave them. Because he knew, like I said, the scripture says it itself, according to his own several ability, he knew what each individual could do. They may not have known it, but he already knew. But the problem was, there was a lack of trust there with one of the servants. They trusted what the master said. They trusted that one day, the master is going to return. What am I going to tell the master when he asked me what I did with his money? Did I take time to invest? Trusting God with finances starts with a relationship with him. It's hard to trust someone you don't know. So when we, the, the closer we get to God and the closer we begin to trust him and form that relationship with him, it's easy for us to trust him with everything, including our finances. So the servant that had five, he invested and gained five more talents. Verse, uh, yeah, um, verse 17. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. So the other servant, he went and he invested. He got two. Oh, but that one. But he that received one went and digged it in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Now, even at the beginning of the scripture, when he delivered them unto his goods, he already had in his mind what he wanted them to do. This one servant, he felt like hiding it was going to make it work for them. So I said that to, for him. I said that to say, I found myself today in my three days of um, spending recklessly. Um, I am, and I will put me out there, I am the wicked servant. And the reason why I put that out there is because we're talking about saving. We're talking about gaining interest. The only interest I gained was from the fast food restaurant. They got my money. I might have got food, but the money is gone. It's not coming back. So we don't even really think about the things that we do. And I love what Pastor Brigham brought up when he first started talking about it. They get us with, I'm just kind of jumping around and go back. They get us with specials. Fast food, two dollars chicken, whatever, whatever, whatever. So you're thinking, oh, I'm only spending a dollar. I'm spending. But if you're going out to eat every day, times five or times seven, because I have ate out seven, di seven days a week one time. And you're thinking, okay, I need the budget. I need to have an investment. But what are you investing if you're spending everything that's coming in? That's right. And I say I'm the wicked servant because it's like, okay, God, you've invested in me. You've given me a good job. I make decent amount of money. But how much of that money am I really seeing at the end of the month? Ask yourself that question. How much of the money that's coming in are you actually seeing? Are we on the side where God is entrusted in us and he's telling us, okay, I've given you this. How much have you invested? Whether it's in the kingdom of God, even personal finances. What have we done? Are we finding ourselves on the end of this wicked servant? Because I, I had to put myself out there. And I was like, okay, God, what you've given me, I'm no better than him that dug it into the earth. Because guess what? Spending it all is just like digging it in the earth. There's no investments. There's no return on that. There's no interest on that. Because it's gone. And I don't know about you all, 
I have a portfolio on my bank, especially when I was a Bank of America. It gives me a portfolio of my spending habits. I told you, I'm going to be very transparent on tonight. Majority of my portfolio on my little cute little pie charts, it was broken down of all of those things that was paid. Food was huge. It was huge. That's why I said I was the wicked servant. I'm going to put me out there. And, I, and, and you know, I, I like to be a little fancy, okay? So I just can't just always have a little dollar cheeseburger. I, if I got to have a salad, it got to be Jason's Deli. It got to be McAllister's. You're not spending 2 and $3 at McAllister's or Jason's Deli. So when you get your portfolio at the end of the month, how much are we really investing and how much of it have we thrown away? Here's some statistics for you. 38% of American adults have an emergency fund to fall back on. 25% of American families have no savings at all. According to the Associated Press Center for Public Affairs Research, two thirds of Americans struggle to scrounge up $1,000 in emergency. Because things happen, whether it be cars, whether it be things are gonna come up, but if you're spending everything, McAllister's, Jason's Deli, Popeye's Chicken, Whataburger, Sonic, mozzarella sticks, gotta have them every time I come from church or wherever. Something comes up, we don't even have $1,000. And somebody may be like, $1,000, that's a lot of money. Truthfully and honestly, it's not. It used to be back probably in the 70s. Now, it's not a lot of money. According to a study from the National Endowment for Financial Education, only 20% of millennials, sorry millennials, I love you all, but this is statistics, demonstrate basic financial literacy. And let's, let me interject this. Those of us who are from Le Hood or Le Country, um, money was not a common commodity because back then we, it was hard times. You know, your mother and father were doing the best they could to make things work. Those of us who grew up in single parent household, mama worked two and three jobs just to make ends meet. But financial literacy was not something they taught because they were so busy working. If you didn't have, you know, the wherewithal to have someone to teach you or you were in school or if they taught it, you just didn't know it. You just know, okay, you work, you pay your bills. You work, you pay your bills. You don't even think about saving because really you haven't had just had a, the, the literacy of it. We're talking about the basic knowledge of it. I'm going to be honest with you, millennials. I'm not picking on you all, but it's the truth. Millennials don't even, some of them don't even know how to fill out a deposit slip. Some don't even know what a check is. Some don't know how to, to register and to uh, do check and balances. I said some because I'm not saying all of you all, but I'm saying these are basic literacy, the basic things that we should know how to do, but they don't. And one thing about numbers, they don't lie. All right. About 77 million Americans or 35% of adults with a credit file have debt and collections reported in their credit file, according to the Urban Institute. On average, these borrowers owe $5,178. We spend and we borrow more than we make. This is why I'm saying, where do we fall in this special? Because I've never, and, and, I'm, and as I'm talking about it, I'm like, oh, Lord, Jesus, help me. Because, you know, we talk about that, you know, on a spiritual sense. Oh, that, I'm not the wicked servant. Oh, how can that servant? That, he didn't know the Lord was coming back. How you just going to do that? How you just going to spend $10 to make a, to buy a salad? You could have went to the store and bought a whole meal prep, what you spent for one salad. But this world is so caught on convenience. And it's convenient for me to pay McAllister's because I don't take the time at night because I'm so busy to prep. But yet it all works against us in the end because our money is not working for us. We're just continually working for our money. And there will not be a return on investment as long as we do that. So just a question. Now that we discussed that, I put me out there. Where do you fall within the parable of the talents?
And when I was looking at the talents, I think about different versions when I was studying this. It was saying that he gave, one said gold and the other one said silver. One version said that he gave five bags, that those five talents was five bags of gold. Can you imagine being entrusted with that much money? And you mean to tell me the master gave you that much money and you can invest any of it? But he did. Even if he had five bags of gold, one bag of gold is still a lot of money. And he hid it. Because he didn't have enough trust in the master. And if we be honest with ourselves, we don't trust God like we say we do. I'm putting a we out there. We, 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 we. I can trust you, God, for this. But my finances, because again, financial literacy is so taboo. I'm going to be honest with you. And in a black community, I'm going to be honest, it's very taboo. We, we, and especially in the, the Pentecostal movement, you know, we, we shout, we jump, we, we do all these things. But when it comes to financial literacy and just the basic knowledge of financial literacy, we miss it. And then we find ourselves upset with God, upset with people, because we are not making good decisions. We're not making sound decisions. And I see why the scripture, and even in, when we go back and look at the commandments, when it talks about covetousness, this world, America, the way it's set up, is teaching us to be, to covet people. And you, it's nothing wrong. If you can afford it, by all means, that's great. But the way the world is going, they want us to look at everyone else and not what you have. You cannot live, we can't live above our means and expect to be blessed. And that's what's happening. We're looking at what's going on on television. And it's sad to say, even as us as a race, we want to wear our wealth. We want to, not only are we eating our wealth, we're wearing our wealth. You want a Gucci purse with Walmart money. I would rather have Gucci money in a Walmart purse. But we, this is why society, and now I see even when Timothy says money is the root of all evil. Because covetousness, greed, that is the problem. And the thing is, when we're saved, our mindset should be different just like these servants. Because at the end of the day, God, you've given me these riches. You've entrusted me with this, and I'm responsible for how I manage it. Because he's given us everything that pertains to knowledge and godliness he tells us he gives us the power to get wealth we want to we want him to do everything but we want to take time budgeting even when you go back in the book i'm going to get into that too talking about the ant how the ant built up for the summer uh, during the summertime so you know the winter was coming we don't do that i'm too busy looking at earl dean ain't nobody here named earl dean you know okay all right, all right. i'm too busy looking at earl dean oh earl dean got a new gucci bag Okay, but Earl Dean makes six figures. I make $5.25 per hour. Why am I worrying about what Earl Dean is doing? I have a saying. Some people like to keep up with the Joneses. My saying is this. I don't need to keep up with the Joneses. Me and the Jacksons are doing just fine. You see what I'm saying? I'm going to live where I am, but even with living where I am, God, are you pleased with what I'm giving and what I'm doing for you? Because being the wicked servant, even though when you're, because we can fathom in our mind, well, I hid it. At least I hid it, but you didn't make an investment on it. He didn't ask you to hide it. He wanted us to multiply what he gave us. And if we be honest with ourselves, we're not multiplying what God has given us. And we're expecting the pastors to do everything, the preachers, fast for me. Well, if you were fast from Popeye's chicken, maybe you could have some extra money. The simple things that we do is actually hurting us and we don't realize it because I'm going to say it. We don't make sound decisions and financial literacy is the thing of the past. People feel like, oh, I don't have to do that. But then you can get an emergency. You don't have any, any emergency money put up to the side. There's no savings. And now, and credit. Again, in the black community, we don't think about this. I don't know how many of y'all remember. I remember, I think I was a senior in high school. Do y'all remember when Sprint used to just give us phones? They used to give phones back in the day. Sprint. They had the cell phones. They used to just give out. They had phones. You can just get them. I mean, literally, your credit could be zero. You can get a, you can get a Sprint phone. What they didn't tell you was, which you should know, that if you don't pay it, it's going to go on your credit. It's going to affect your credit because you don't think a cell phone can go on your credit and affect your credit. But it did. I told you I'm being very transparent tonight. 
Hello? Just using the phone? Girl, go on to Sprint. You can get a phone in Sprint. Dad, just get you a phone. Go on to get that phone in Sprint. Uh, yeah, pay for it. You got to pay for it. You just can't get it. And we're so used as consumers. We're talking about doing the recession. They talked about the consumers then, how the consumers were basically, because consumers, we're the ones who really make the economy up. And they're giving that to you, but if you don't have financial knowledge and literacy, even in something as basic as a cell phone, and because we don't take credit seriously, because unfortunately, even the way we're taught, you know, just go and pay on it, pay out, pay on it, pay on it. But you're not looking at your interest rate. I can, someone that has a credit score of 700 could go and get something at a credit, a, a interest rate of 3%. I have a 560, I'm paying 19% for five years. Who's winning? For the same thing. And because credit is something, and I keep saying this, especially in our community, we don't stress it. We don't stress financial literacy. We don't stress how important it is and how reputable it is. Even for my job that I currently have, I had to do a credit check just to get my job. So credit is important. If you make wise choices and decisions, credit is important. Let's stop being the wicked servant. And let's move on to being the good servant. I, whether it's five, two, whatever God has entrusted us to have, let's find ourselves on that side of the spectrum because he's coming back. Now, we're going to talk about the spiritual aspect of it, but right now we're talking about the finances, just like this servant. We can think we're doing things right, but we're not doing them. There's a scripture, and I want to read this scripture because I love this scripture. And this is the New Living Translations uh, Version. It's Proverbs 21 and 20. Proverbs 21, 20 through 21. Proverbs 21, 20 through 21 reads, The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Whoever pursues righteous and unfailing love will find life, righteousness, and honor. So there are some spending habits that's causing us from being good stewards of what God has given us. And you know, something that Pastor Brigham said, and he and it was true, sometimes we gotta write this stuff out because it's easy to talk about it. So on tonight, we are all gonna be without excuse, okay? All of us, we gonna, all of us, we gonna be all without excuse because guess what I have on tonight, okay? You ready? An estimated budget sheet, Amen. And I'm like, Oprah, you get one, and you get one, and you get one. We all get one, okay? We're going to budget. If God said that he's going to bless this church through the people, and you may say, well, I don't have enough. What are we doing with the little bit that God has given us? When it's time for the return on the investment, what are we going to look like? When it's wrote down, when it's on paper, then if you want to transfer it electronically, because I know I'm going to do the same thing for me, but it's one thing to start it. The problem with us as a race of people, we don't like to finish. We execute, but we don't finish. But financial literacy starts with us. We cannot expect everyone else to do everything for us. It starts with us. No one can make you. God has given us the opportunity to do this and talk about it, but talking about it and not doing it, we're no better than a wicked servant because God has entrusted us with these things. We can quote the scriptures and I'm the head and not the tail. Yeah, but when you're broke, you are the tail. And then singles, as singles, you know, it, finances are important. I, I, one thing I appreciate God for, I don't go into things in an unrealistic expectations. Just because I'm single, I don't, I'm not one of the women that think, oh, he got to be he got to have all his stuff together. He got to have this. He got to have that. I'm very opposite of that because I'm, I believe that I'm just as much responsible for my finances as he is. There's no, there's no reason why I should go into a marriage with a man who has himself together, but I'm coming in with bad credit or just, you know what I'm saying? Things about me that's going to, I got liens on my property, all kind of stuff. We can't even file our tax together because, you know what I'm saying? But I'm saying we don't talk, but this is what I'm saying. We don't discuss these things. And then we get into marriage. And then six months down the line, we in the pastor's office because he tired of me, man. This woman, th- 
why y'all didn't tell me? That was your responsibility first and foremost, but anyway. But I'm just saying, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not a one-sided woman. You understand what I'm saying? Times have changed. Now, back in the day, you know, as women, we stayed home. We took care of the kids. We didn't have to worry about credit and all that kind of stuff because the man was a true provider. But unfortunately, in this day and time, you know, both male and females are working now. So it's fair that we work on ourselves as individuals. I, I, I can't stand a selfish person who thinks it's all about everybody else but them. It's not fair to the spouse if you will have all this stuff going on. Work on it while we're single. I'm talking to the singles because... Finances, believe it or not, is one of the number one things that causes divorces in marriages. I'm saying. So if we work on these things and make these things applicable to us, then we don't have any excuses for why we're not producing. So I'm going to talk about now some things that causes us to, that causes our credit scores to drop. What are eight things that can cause your credit score to drop drastically? The first thing, late and missed payments. It compromises your credit score 35%. So not paying your bills on time or completely missing them. Believe it or not, a simple phone call for a rearrangement helps. It does. If you just call the creditor and say, hey, I'm going to be late on such and such. Can I get an extension? That helps. Versus not paying at all. And then now if you do le- if it's late, now you've incurred late fees. And when you're paying on a car and there's late fees, that goes on, tags on to the, the note and the interest. So now you're really paying more for something that's already no longer worth anything. The value is already depreciated. The next one, too many credit requests. So let's say, okay, you JCPenney, you like, oh, come and get a car from JCPenney. They want you to go get a car from JCPenney. Then you over here, you want to look, you're looking at a car. They don't pull your credit from the car. So too many, you know, just, just inquiring too much. Those hard inquiries like cars or, or this, I gave an example, um, a home equity lines of credit. They have to pull your credit to get this stuff. And you have to get them permission to do it. But these, they don't tell you that those things affects our credit. And it looks bad on the credit side of it because it's like, okay, why do you have so many inquiries on your credit? It looks bad. So it's, I gave an example, applying for um, home equity lines of credit within a short span of time or car loans. Now, there's a caveat. If you have multiple requests for a, sp- a specific or one type of credit within a short period of time, this counts as one instead of multiple inquiries. But that's the catch. It has to be for the same thing in a short period of time versus over a span of time and from like January to, to March. Sure. If you have multiple requests for a specific or one type of credit within a short period of time, this counts as one instead of multiple inquiries on your credit. Because believe it or not, those things hurt us. Even when you're thinking, oh, they just, I'm just looking at this. They want to pull my credit. Be very cautious of being your, having your credit pulled all the time, especially around this time for the holiday season. Hey, would you like to get this? No, I will not. Thank you. Thank you. Unpaid student loans. They can even garnish your wages for that. Unpaid student loans. And as a student myself, you'll be surprised if you call them and say, hey, I may not have $50, but can I work out $15 a month? They will work with you. But we, we just don't take the time. They just like, oh, they taking my money. I'm just going to let them take it. I'm crazy. You're not just taking my money. We're going to talk about this. We're going to discuss it. And what the lower CSR cannot do, let me speak to your supervisor. I'm her. Sorry, I am. Because if I'm willing to work with you about something that I owe you, you should be able to work with me. Somebody is going to, but sometimes we don't have enough boldness or enough consistency or tenacity to just stay and be like, you know what? I need to get somebody on this phone that's going to help me because they'll help you. And here's the big one. Collections. Sprint bills. Insurance. Hospital bills. These collections do not look good on our credit. At my job, as I said, they look for, 
you cannot have more than $10,000 worth in collections. They will not hire you. Just saying. Now, this is unfortunate. This does happen. But unemployment plays a big part in our credit file because we know we're not making money. We can't pay bills. So it does affect our credit score if, however, if we don't make the proper arrangements. So that's still without an excuse as well. We're responsible to make the proper arrangements even during our unemployment or maybe our tight times. Six, private or government liens. If there is a lien on your property, it will affect your credit score. Whether it's a mechanics lien, whatever, it's going to affect your credit score. Yeah, right. Like it can be your home. It can be your auto, any type of lien. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're not working with that creditor in regards to it. It can still affect your, your, your credit score. Seven says, closing cards with remaining balances. So you have credit cards that still have balances on it, and you close it. You're supposed to have a revolving credit, but if you close it, that looks bad on your end. That affects your credit score as well. And I was just like, oh, my God, really? Literally, just how you're looking, Sister Hubbard, that's how I was looking doing this. Paying it off. The, the thing about paying it off, that's the thing, and that's the thing about credit. Because when we talk about credit and owing, it's not when we owe, because our debt to ratio really is what gets us in trouble. Because if, you're get, if you have more debt than you, do ha than you do income, that's what the problem comes in at. So paying them off is, is one thing. It doesn't look bad on your credit because you're paying off. It's just that when there's large balances left on it, on your credit card. Does, you see what I'm saying? I, I'm, no, this, you can talk to me. It's okay. We're, did, you ever, did you want to interject on that, Pastor Brigham? No, to my, she just mean a credit card and period. Just like, like, pay it off right, that's what you're supposed to do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That looks good on your credit. That's you yeah, that's how you do it. We're talking about, we, you know that, for instance, because you can't pay it. You, you don't win and spend $6,000. You had a, you had a $6,000 limit. You spent this whole $6,000 limit on there. And, uh, yeah. No, when you have a remaining balance, you have, a, it's still a balance on there. You're closing it out because you can't pay for it. You see what I'm saying? Paying it off is different. That's good. We're talking about when there's still a remaining balance on that card and you close it. That, yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's enough. Paying it off is one thing. Paying it off is good. Let me just throw that out there. Okay. Eight. This is one, where, this is one that's it's true. We don't do it. Ignoring potential inaccuracies. Meaning, I don't know about you all, but I have credit monitoring. For all three, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. I check my credit scores. I check the things that are on them. I check addresses. I see if they have the wrong names on them because guess what I'm going to do? Dispute, 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 dispute. Hello, Experian. I used to be a dispute queen. I would get on Experian's website. They used to have a dispute resolution center, and I would do it my own, disputing on my own credit report and get things removed off my credit, my credit report. But people are not taught this stuff. You don't know it. You're just thinking, oh, it's my credit report. If my middle initiative is L, and I say, and it says Tiffany N. Dunnell, who is that? That's not me. You need to remove that. And they have to do it within 30 days. Especially with common names. If your name is coming, Mary Smith, you know, Deb, all these common names. But if something is off on your credit report, that's why you need to. And there's a website Every year, you can pull your credit report and get all three credit reports and scores, freeannualcreditreport.com. Pull your credit. Monitor your credit. Don't wait for anyone else to do it. If there's any inaccuracies from names to addresses to debts, and you know for a fact that you did not make dispute 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 they have 30 days to respond if they do not they must remove remove it from your report you can be your own credit resolution specialist you don't have to pay hundreds of dollars for someone to do it but it's the what i'm saying is we don't take the time to do these things 
It takes work. And I'm, I'm a very consistent and persistent woman. I get it from my mother. I'm telling you, I will get on the phone. I will talk. If I've talked to someone, I had an incident where there was a um, judgment on my um, credit from rental, bad rental history. However, I tried to work with this rent, with the company. I tried to make payments. They were so rude to me. I did everything that I possibly could. I disputed that and got it off my credit. Because as a, de as a debtor, I tried to work with the creditor. You would not work with me, so what do you want me to do? But you kept putting it on my report. I'm telling you as I'm standing here right now, if we pull my report, that judgment is off my report. So I'm telling you it can be done. They have email. They have certain individuals that you can contact and reach, and they will help you get these things off your credit. But we don't want to take the time to do it. The freeannualcreditreport.com, I'm sharing it with you now. Well, the thing is, that's what I was about to say. That's where your research comes in. I don't have your credit report. So what you do when you pull your credit report, there, are, there is a certain contact on there. And then when you talk to the representative, you can even ask for it. Well, is there an email for someone that I can contact or I can send this information to? Or who, who is your dispute? Where is your dispute resolution center? Who is a dispute rep uh, resolution representative? But I know Experian, they actually have dispute resolution on their website, and you can dispute things on your, you can pull your credit up. And if there's something on your credit that you, that you don't recognize, you can dispute it right there and submit it on Experian. Now, TransUnion and, and Equifax is different. You actually have to call a representative. But they always have someone, there's a contact that you can always call. Each credit bureau is different. That's what I was trying to get to. Each credit bureau, so I can tell you today, Oh, contact Amy, but that might, be, that might not be the same person. So as individuals, as we're checking our own credit scores, you, it's, you're, we're responsible for knowing who we need to contact. So you, if you have to call a 1-800 number and wait for an hour, I will do it. Because this is financial literacy. And that's what they get us at because they know we're not going to take the time to do this stuff. So you can, you can just report stuff on my credit. Believe it or not, some of our credit scores are low because there's inaccuracies on there. But just like now, we don't want to take the time to wait and get a representative, dispute it, send the necessary documents, send the documents, fax it. And if you don't, if they say mail it, I ask it a minute, hey, is there a fax number? Can I fax this information to you? Sure. We have a dedicated fax line. Okay, please give it to me. Get the representative that you spoke with. Keep the records. So if something comes, I spoke to Mary on October 15th, and she said this and this, I faxed this, this and this. Keep all that stuff, but it's possible. Not checking your reports and scores for errors or mistakes is, um, one, is the last step. Look for incorrect addresses or debt, or debt that doesn't belong to you. We are responsible for our own individual literacy as far as finances are concerned. This is why our credit scores are the way they are. You'd be surprised. Okay, I don't know if I ever shared this with you all. I have a cousin whose name also is Tiffany Donnell. My middle name was the L. Hers is with the N. But if they just report on my credit report, just Tiffany Donnell on there? Because we have the same name. That's what I'm saying. This is the kind of stuff you have to look at. I thought it was crazy. I was like, oh, my God, now I got somebody the same name as me. I got to really watch that. Because if they're not paying attention, even though we are living in the age of technology, they do have human data, you know, people that's entering the data, and mistakes happen. But it's our job, as my old professor used to say, to do our due diligence. So we're about to wrap it up, people. Okay. Financial maturity. There are three parts to financial maturity. Learning what your needs, wants, and desires. What's a need? A need is basic necessities of life, which includes food, shelter, clothing, and employment. A want, a choice you make about the quality of goods. Example, designer label clothing versus discount clothing. That includes discount clothes, even the thrift store. You can spend too much money in the thrift store. Hello, I have. Steak versus hamburgers, a new car versus a used car wants desires goods we dream about having but they are choices that aren't essential to our survival safety or well-being the these the 
I guess you want to say proving of a true person who has financial maturity, they know how to differentiate all three. My needs, my wants, and my desires. We all know we have to have the needs. We need water. We need clothes. We need shoes. You know, those are needs. Those are things we got to have. But some of the stuff, these designer bags, all these shoes, all the, I have to clean my, I'll be real. I need to clean my closet out right now. I, I don't, I literally, I can wear things and you can be like, she's been shopping, stuff I've been having in my closet for her. And who's been, and, and the thing is, we live in such a gluttonous society, again, because I say we're talking about covetousness, being that wicked servant, you're just heaping things that are unnecessary, but not thinking about God. How can we be a blessing to other people? How can someone else benefit from our goods? So financial maturity, that's how you know if you are into that category. Do you spend more on your desires and your wants than you do your needs? Yes, ma'am. Financial matu- this financial maturity. Knowing the difference between your needs, wants, and desires. And if we be honest with ourselves, even the saints of God, we, got, we get caught up on our wants and our desires more than we do our needs. So when it's time for, oh, I need five people to stand up for $5, well, I don't even have $5 at the end of the, of the month. Because I've spent it on things that were not of necessity. My mother taught me at a young age. She said, what thing you do, you pay your bills first. If you don't have any money left, your bills are paid. But the problem now, people want to impress people who really don't care anything about them. But yet you're broke at the end of the month. Our needs, and one thing about me, I can say my mom is still that in me. So I'm not big. I'm not one that's crazy. I'm not spending my light bill money for a purse or some shoes. or No, 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 no. I'm paying my lights. I'm paying my rent. We got to also have our things in order. People don't have their priorities in order. Winston Churchill said it best. He who fails to plan is planning to fail. So if we don't plan this stuff and put it out there, we will never, ever, ever reach our goals. Keys to financial literacy. Here's some keys. Now, we talked about all the bad stuff. We talked about the wicked servant. I don't know by now. Is anyone else in the room? I mean, you don't have to raise your hand. Is anybody else? They find themselves on a wicked service side. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Did y'all, y'all want to raise your hands? Y'all don't have to raise your hands. Don't incriminate yourself. Okay. So, I don't know about you all. So, by now, hopefully, by the end, we'll, we'll get to the point where we all going to be the, the servant that gave a ROI. You know what I'm saying? God could be like, yes, when he comes back, I've been trusted in you. And let's talk about on the spiritual side before I get into the keys of financial literacy. What has God entrusted in each and every one of us individually, spiritually, and what are we doing with the talents that he's given us, the gifts he's put in us? Whatever he's given us, are we doing our due diligence to make sure that when he comes back, he's going to find us being good stewards of what he gave us? That's it. So keys to financial literacy. We know the things that are bad. We know the things that we need to do. These are just some short steps for financial literacy. First things first, list any short and long-term goals that will require you having to set some savings aside. Everyone needs goals, short-term and long-term. Things you can accomplish, short-term goals right now. List them. It's good to have it in writing. List them. What amounts can be cut out of your budget in order to start making this reality. So go through your bills, go through things that you have and decide what things can we do to make our short-term, long-term financial goals a reality. Practice saving money. I'm gonna repeat that one more time. Practice saving money. Can you hear me in the back? Practice saving money on a regular basis basis. I'm going to throw this in there. And I, when I read this, it slapped me in my face. You ready? Even if you are in debt, 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 even if you're in debt, you can save. We think because we're in debt, we think because we don't have anything, we can't save. Believe it or not, a small investment of just $5 can really change your life. If you don't have much, start off small. 
Believe it or not, we have more than five dollars too. We really do. That's the financial maturity. Are you being more cautious on your needs? Or are you more conscious on, conscious on your wants and your desires? Because at the end of the month, it's going to show. If we budget correctly, we could even practice saving money while we're in debt. If you can save no more than $5 a month, develop a discipline of saving and not always spending. So that's going to be our all of our homework. Let's write down our long term. Which one? Practice saving money on a regular basis, even if you are in debt. If you can save no more than $5 a month, in which we can, we can save more than that, actually. Develop a discipline of saving and not always spending. Develop that habit of saving and not always spending. So, our homework as a whole, because I got to do it too, is to write down our long-term and short-term financial goals, whether it may be, okay, I'm saving for a house or I'm saving for whatever. Whatever it is that we know that we want, let's write it out on paper. Let's put ourselves to the test. You hear what I'm saying? Our, our we, I'm using pronouns here. You see what I'm saying? Because I'm included in this. If we expect to be financially and debt-free is things that we must do for ourselves. And I had some more scriptures to you all. I'm just trying not to keep y'all all night because some of us got to go and make our dressing and stuff. Okay. Oh, let me give you the scripture too. Oh, well, let me, well, wait a minute. Let me go back. So what we want, I'm going to go back to the, the parable of the talents. So we know what we fall as far as the um, servant is concerned. What we want to hear God say to us is verse 21. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. This is what we want to hear at the, at the end of the day. We want to hear him say, well done. We don't want him to be upset with us. Because believe it or not, our money matters to God. God don't need, mo need money we need it. But we, he's given us the tools. He's given us the knowledge. He's given us the wherewithal that we need to make the money work for us and not us work for the money. We don't have to get second jobs. It is. But you know what? Where there is no trust, there's second, third, and fourth jobs. Been there, done that. And I'm going to give a secret too with paying tithes. Even when I was not making the money that I used to make, I thank God for the money he gave me regarding tithes. I still would pay, I was still paying my tithes like I was making the money that I used to make. We just, and I'm just going to give my testimony. That was just like six months ago. I was not making the money that I was making. But I kept the same tithes. And God blessed me. He blessed me. Um, also, I wanna, that's what I want to throw in too. Not only do I have budget estimators for everyone, I have some little guidelines for every type of situation. This is someone who's married with four children. And what I love about this is it includes tithe giving and automatically has 10% at the top because we're required to give our 10%. So it breaks it down. So for instance, if you are married with four children and let's say your annual income is 25%, underneath that bracket, they broke down everything that you should do to be able to save. And don't just stop married with one child, married with two, single, no one's left out. So we all are going to have some lovely parting gifts once we leave on tonight. Everyone's going to have some beautiful parting gifts to, to get this ball rolling. Because I don't know about you all, I want to see the church prosper. I want us to individually be able to prosper and be able to be a benefit to the kingdom of God and help. Because everyone that comes through those doors is not going to have. But if we're in position to help, it makes the difference. And that is what I'm striving to do. I'm striving to be a lender and not always being a borrower. I don't know about you all, but I am. I'm striving. I just got to stay out of McAllister's and Jason's Deli. 
yeah, those places that you don't even have to walk into, you just go online and use your points. Or, you know, you, they know you, oh, yeah, just give her the regular. Ugh. Just like this morning. I, I told y'all, I'm telling myself, we're going to get out of here. Spend $4.90 at the donut shop because I left my smoothie on the table running out the house and spend $4 at the donut shop. But think about it. If I spend 4 or $5 every day, now I spent already $30 alone just in food. We got to do better. But after tonight, I'm graduating from the wicked servant, okay? Amen. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm going to graduate. I don't, I'm not going to. I want him to say, well done. I want him. And I'm at a point. I'm in this thing where I'm doing. God is concerned about the whole man. That's mental. That's spiritual. That's physical. I don't want to get into all that, but we already know. Even the things we eat and all that. We got to take care of ourselves. But. He's concerned about us because if we're in deficits, we can't, we can't help people in deficit. And finances is important. At the end of the day, this is church, but the church, where it runs on money. We got to have money. Amen. Proverbs 27 and 24, and we're going to wrap this up. I didn't mean to take this much time, you all. I'm so sorry. 24 and 20, 27, Proverbs 27 and 24 says, For riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation. So at the end of the day, we want to have financial literacy, but at the end of the day, we want to also remember that we can't take none of this stuff with us. And every generation, okay, it's not, may not ha- it may not happen for every generation. They may not, everybody may not, may not get the riches, but they can be passed, they can, we can pass down the knowledge. We can pass down the information so they all know they'll be without excuse when it comes down to financial literacy. But we do know at the end of the day, because I don't want to be like, we just talking about finances. We know we can't take this stuff with us. But at the end of the day, we need to know how to be good stewards of the things that God has given us. Because unfortunately, the sinner man is doing circles around us. We come to church, we speak in tongues, we praying, but we broke. We can't even do the things that's necessary to go forth because we're spending and taking care of wants and desires over necessities. But if we apply these basic principles to our lives and really do the things that's needful, we can be successful spiritually, mentally, physically, and financially. We have the keys and the tools to do it We got to be like Nike and just do it. No more excuses. God has given us our talents. And he said, according to your several ability, if he only gave you one talent, plow it. Make an investment. Do what's needed to increase what he's given us. Whatever God has given us. Everyone's not going to make the same amount of money. And me personally, I I don't even desire to be rich. I just want to be comfortable. I want to be able to pay my bills, to bless people. I don't want to be a millionaire. You ain't never going to hear me talking about, we going to be me, ah, whatever. Ah, That ain't my thing. I I don't want to be a millionaire. You see what I'm saying? I've worked in University Park, and I know what money does to people. I work with money. I know what money does to people, and it stinks. I don't like it. Because it brings on a whole type of flair that I don't like. And not only do do I not like it, God don't like it. I come from humble beginnings. I plan on dying in humble, in, um, humble endings. You understand what I'm saying? I, but in my humble ending, I want to be able to say that I helped people. And I was able to not just live paycheck to paycheck. Yes, that's, that's what I'm striving for. And somebody may say, well, I'm already this age. I'm 36. And, hey, I had to hit it, hit it hard. But I'm willing to go that extra mile and do my due diligence to make sure that I'm operating and financial literacy in everything that I'm doing. Because we no longer can afford to be financial illiterate. Amen. We can't. We cannot. It's time for us to get our finances together. It's time for us to be what God has called us to be. Because if we continue like we are, we will forever be in debt. And we will forever be the borrower. And we will never be able to lend to anyone. So. And I think I gave myself a topic. I did. I never told y'all that. It was God, finances, and you. I'm sorry if I didn't give y'all that earlier because I told y'all I was kind of nervous about this. So God, finances, and you, where do you fall on the spectrum? Can God trust you with the finances? Which servant are you? 
Where do you fall on the spectrum? I told y'all myself, I called myself out. Just wicked. Not being a good steward. But we all are going to do this together. We all going to do this together. And like I said, we're going to have our pardon gifts. And we're going to look over our budgets. So our homework as a whole is to write down our short and long-term financial goals. In the midst of doing your short-term and long-term goals, go over your your bills, see what things can be cut or kind of maneuvered around to make your financial goals reality. That's our homework as a whole. And one word I'm going to use, and we're closing, we're going to be accountable to each other. I might come to the hope, might be like, uh, so Tiffany, did you go to McAllister's today? I can't have an attitude but like, man, why she in my business? Ain't none of your business, Hubbard. Why is you in my business? Let me have my salad. Oh, come on. Before we close, come on. Yes. Right. But I would say this. That's no. If it's worked, I'm going to put it like this. If it's worked in, no, let me throw that in there before we close. If it's worked in your budget. Now, I'm going to say this. I'm not, now, don't, I hope it didn't come across like, oh, Lord, I just can't spend no money on myself. I just got to be a job. Turkey every day. No, I'm not saying that. Work even some of your desires. Truth be told, we should be living off 10% of our paycheck. And cash is king. If you don't want to spend on a debit card, take up that 10% and put it in cash. And do not spend more than that 10%. In that 10%, work your desire in there. 10%, cash is king. If you know you're going to pay yourself 10%, just like you pay your bills, you're paying your tithes and offering, pay yourself 10% of your check. And 10% of your check, don't use your debit card, use cash. If that cash is gone, that's it for the month, for that check. Don't spend it, even if you have it. Even if you're making the money, act like you're not making the money. And we're going to notice and we're going to watch God. And we're going to watch God increase our uh, money and increase and it's going to help us and we're going to work on our relationship with him because it's going to be like God I trust you so much that I even trust you with my finances and you're going to stretch it if I'm a good steward of what you've given me so we're going to spend and we're going to work in the overflow that's what we're going to do so cash is going to be king always but you pay yourself working your needs your wants and your desires for that 10% that's it. If in my 10%, I can give me a, if y'all see me coming with a McAllister bag, I'm going to be like, hey, that's in my 10%. That's in my 10%. I need you to not even be worrying about this right now, okay? Well, basically, well, yeah, because that's what you're paying, you're paying yourself. And you don't want to live more over that 10%. I don't care how much you make per month. This is just how we're going to start off. If you can manage 10%, you understand what I'm saying? And within your budget, you know what works for you. After we, that's why we're going to set these goals and we're going to go over our budget and we're going to write it out because when you write it out, you can tell exactly what you can do and what you can't do. So within that 10%, maybe you can work in at the, at the end of the month a need or a desire. You probably can. Does that make sense? But work that in within that. Don't spend more. That's it. Clear as mud clear as mud amen so i thank you all oh I'm st- i was so nervous y'all oh god lord so i don't know why i was so nervous like i'm so serious i